Another important section of the thermal program was a study dealing with normal city vulnerability to fire started by atomic weapons. Three cubicle houses, 7,700 feet from zero, were erected for one phase of this study concerned with exterior kindling fuels. The first house has a clean, safe yard, but dry rot is working in the unpainted siding. No rot here, but toys, weeds, and trash against the fence. A clean yard, painted fence, and maintained siding. Number nine goes off, 13 calories per square centimeter. Overpressure, three and a half pounds per square inch. Time sequence photography shows the results. Destruction on the right from the yard trash which set fire to the fence. On the left, rotted wood in the siding was the ignition point. Sound painted wood and a clean yard allow the center house to survive. The fire hazards in these projects are not unusual either. Six big American cities were inspected to ensure that representative conditions were tested. Conditions which suggest that a bomb of even this nominal power could start more than 100,000 fires over 25 square miles of urban area. Our next thermal project run on shot 10 required a new instrument line east from ground zero, roughly opposite the main blast line, equipped with thermal recording devices and with blast gauges at zero and 10 foot heights. The first phase, designed to find out how much protection white smoke would give against thermal flash, employed a standard oil fog over a portion of the new line. In theory, this smoke would scatter and reflect fireball heat. This was a small-scale experiment, but evaluations have indicated that attenuation of radiant energy approached 99%. To explain the second phase of the project, employing black smoke, we must go back to Tumblr Snapper. On the low altitude burst of Tumblr 4, high-speed cameras recorded a phenomenon never noticed before, a shock wave preceding the main shock front. Here it is again. This precursor wave, as it was called, registers on blast line instruments with a pressure time graph of this type showing a considerable climb and duration before arrival of the main shock front. A normal shock wave with no precursor is quite different, hitting the instruments with an instantaneous pressure jump. The mechanics of precursor development appear to be these. A weapon bursts, and thermal radiation creates an intensely hot ground layer of air, a layer filled with dust from what is called the popcorning of the hot ground. Milliseconds after the thermal flash, the incident shock wave reaches the ground and expands, trailed outward by the usual reflected wave. Then a new wave, the precursor, begins to build out from the base of the incident wave, racing ahead through the heated air layer. An intense dust cloud follows closely, rising initially to about 50 feet and later to several hundred feet. One important effect of the precursor is to lower peak static pressures without a corresponding reduction of dynamic or wind pressures. The precursor builds steadily in height, but does not seem to inhibit formation of a mock stem, though exact dimensional relationships are uncertain. Eventually, running into cooler regions, the precursor slows and is overtaken by the mock stem. From that point on, the blast wave structure is normal again. It should be emphasized that a precursor can form only if the ground air layer is sufficiently hot. So if height of burst is increased, yield must be increased. Without the yield increase, the ground air will be too cool for precursor formation, as was the case on shot nine, our first effect shot, 26 kT at 2,400 feet, shot 10. 15 kT at only 500 feet, developed a strong precursor. It was on this shot that we ran the smoke experiment. A carbon black smoke was established over nearly a mile of the new instrument line. We expected that the top of the black smoke would absorb thermal energy and produce an extra hot layer well above ground, possibly generating a controlled super precursor at that height, or in some other manner reducing blast effects on ground targets. The experiment was handicapped 
to an unknown degree by wind billowing the smoke up to three or four hundred feet, modifying the planned geometry. As it happened, the ground level precursor which developed under the smoke was stronger than the one in the clear, although it extended only half as far before decaying to a conventional blast form. This test was not conclusive as to the effects of a heat absorbing black smoke on blast. A further precursor study was set up to determine whether ground surface heating from thermal flash could generate a shock wave before arrival of the normal shock front. Panels 10 feet square, faced with variously heat absorptive and reactive materials, were tilted for maximum exposure to the thermal radiation of the two effect shots. Post-shot study of the gauge records showed no clear evidence of thermally induced shock waves. We come now to the biggest program, the primary reason for shot nine, the first effect shot. The biggest program in sheer volume, in theoretical predictions confirmed or refuted, and in the mass of empirical knowledge gained. Twenty-eight separate projects came under this heading beginning with basic measurements on simple cylinders and rectangular concrete slab structures in a number of orientations. These passive targets, heavily instrumented, were not designed for response by displacement, but only to record shielding and loading factors at various heights and aspects. The findings of this important job can now be extrapolated for prediction of blast loading on a great variety of targets without direct testing. We begin to bump into the precursor again. A truss bridge section 2,300 feet from zero. Shot 9, 26 kT, 2,400 feet high, produced a small permanent set in the top cord with an overpressure of 11 and a half pounds per square inch. But the mock stem had not formed to reach the height of the bridge. Eight and a half pounds did this on shot 10. 500 feet high, 15 kiloton yield with a precursor blast wave and a mock stem already higher than the bridge. Apparently, for wind or drag sensitive targets of this type, a low burst is more damaging than a high burst at similar peak pressures. A test of Army prefab Bailey bridges. Shot nine, 4,100 feet from zero. Essentially undamaged, the bridge slid back on its piers as expected, moving 43 inches from a peak pressure of eight pounds. Nine pounds from shot 10 hits another bridge. Movement out of all proportion to that caused by almost the same static pressure on the first shot. Army equipment, which included 54 trucks and jeeps, was exposed to shot nine pressures ranging up to 21 pounds to the inch. Thermal input reached 130 calories per square centimeter. Damage was generally moderate, as expected. All but two vehicles, one with burned tires and one with a missile punctured radiator could be driven away under their own power. For shot 10, army tanks, artillery, and 22 trucks were exposed to pressures expected to range from three to 55 PSI. Once more, damage was much greater than expected. Equipment was not merely overturned, but often torn to pieces or hurled great distances at overpressures from which no such effects were predicted. Pressures which had done negligible damage to identical items on shot nine. Obviously, shot 10 was handing out surprise data. It was evident that our old static pressure criteria were not valid for predicting damage to wind sensitive targets in the precursor region of low bursts. Not only were there violent high frequency pressure fluctuations in this region, but the precursor depressed static pressures no longer had the same relation to dynamic or blast wind pressures found in a normal shock wave. Standard command posts, foxholes, and machine gun positions were located on shot nine at 600, 800, and 4,000 feet from zero. Over pressures eight to 22 pounds to the inch. General analysis indicated that cover supporting timbers began to fail at eight PSI while revetment stood up to around 20 pounds. Conventional sandbags tended to catch fire and spill their contents. One interesting finding was that foxhole covers can greatly reduce inside pressures, which may otherwise build to twice the outside pressure. 
Field hospital installations were displayed for shot nine at ranges around 4,400, 9,000, and 15,000 feet in both above ground and dug in positions at each location. Radiology sections, operating rooms, pharmacy tents, all complete and ready for use. 38 calories per square centimeter. Eight pounds per square inch. Operationally a complete ruin, although a few items of equipment were salvageable. Missile hazard was unquestionably heavy. The 15,000 foot installation, around one and one quarter pounds pressure. Damage limited to collapse of the above ground tents. A significant finding of these tests was that considerable protection to personnel and equipment would be afforded by revetting field medical installations. Six Marine LVTs, landing vehicles tracked, at distances from 800 to 4,500 feet from zero, with pressures reaching 22 PSI, 2,400 feet, overpressure 11 pounds. Damage was light on all vehicles. On shot 10, the same vehicles varied from 1,000 to 3,450 feet from zero, pressures running up to 47 pounds. Shot 10 damage was again unexpectedly heavy as compared with shot 9, with one vehicle destroyed and three severely damaged in the precursor region, which on this shot extends out to around a half mile from ground zero. These tests suggest that normal shock waves from high bursts will damage LVTs only moderately up to 22 PSI, while low bursts will do severe damage above 12 and a half pounds. Curtain wall panels on a series of concrete test cells, some with window openings, some without. The panels were constructed of various masonry materials such as brick, cinder block, clay tile, and combinations of these materials. Similar variety went into roofs and interior partitions. On shot nine, four and a half pounds overpressure does this. 6,700 feet from zero. Seven pounds here, 4,400 feet range. Unreinforced bricks stood up fairly well, though cinder block and transite shattered. Walls with 20% window opening showed much greater blast resistance than blank walls, though damage to interior partitions was high. Three frame structures with windows and skylights containing various types of glass and plastic glazings were set up at 7,600, 12,500, and 20,000 feet from shot nine. Pressures were four PSI or lower. A few conclusions that can be drawn now are that quarter inch clear plastic shattered least of the material tested. Quarter inch wire mesh was the largest mesh effective in reducing interior missile hazard. Exterior jealousies were worthless. And explosion hardware has very limited usefulness and may even be disadvantageous. Signal core placed radial and transverse pole lines, underground wires and aluminum towers at different distances to test damage effects and determine time required to restore communication facilities. On shot nine, Pressures of seven to nine PSI knocked down the transverse pole lines at 3,500 and 4,500 feet and partially destroyed lines at 5,500 feet in the five pound region. However, radial pole lines end on to the blast were almost undamaged. Similarly, towers at 3,400 and 4,400 feet were knocked down and the one at 5,400 feet heavily damaged. At 6,400 feet, the top section of this 240-foot tower was made unsafe by four and a half PSI. Shot 10 damage to these installations was much heavier. The blast winds destroyed even the radial pole line to 2,500 feet, with static pressures by which it was undamaged on shot nine. Air Force, Marine, and Quartermaster POL installations were given extensive testing. The major items were five and 55 gallon drum stacks, bulk storage tanks, and various subsidiary items such as can cleaning, metering, filtering, and pumping equipment. 
In general, shot nine damage was light or insignificant. There were minor gasoline fires. Drum and can stacks were scattered slightly in the maximum pressure areas, around 16 PSI. Two collapsible 900-gallon tanks were ruptured by 11 pounds at 2,600 feet. On shot 10, results were unexpectedly violent. All stacks disintegrated, with cans and drums thrown hundreds of feet and left flattened or badly crushed. All marine fuel handling equipment was destroyed except one collapsible tank. Almost complete destruction occurred at better than 2,000 feet, at the same pressures that did trivial damage on shot nine. A study of tactical importance. 145 ponderosa pines set in concrete, approximately 6,400 feet from shot nines zero. Instrumentation was thorough. A few major types being pressure gauges at three heights, time recording anemometers, pitot-type dynamic pressure detectors, and snubber wire arrangements to measure deflections. Pendulums were substituted for the lollipops of former operations to provide mechanical simulation of tree response. As on many of these projects, camera stations were set up to provide high-speed motion picture coverage of blast effects. Thermal input, 18 calories per square centimeter resulting in only mild char on tree trunks, since the normal ground litter that will ignite at around three calories was lacking. Static pressures around four PSI. Post-blast survey indicated that approximately 20% of the trees were broken, and the missile hazard from falling trunks and limbs would be substantial. There was scant reduction of static pressure inside the stand, but a 20 to 40% reduction of dynamic or drag pressures. Thermal shielding proved excellent, with negligible penetration beyond the fourth row of trees. Sixteen items of Army rolling stock were exposed on shot ten only. A 45-ton diesel locomotive, one riveted and one welded steel tank car. Thirteen boxcars loaded and unloaded of various types. 6,600 feet, two pounds overpressure. 4,400 feet, four PSI. One empty boxcar turned over, one loaded car damaged. 3,400 feet, six PSI. Boxcars damaged or overturned. 2,800 feet, seven and a half pounds. 1,850 feet, nine pounds. 1,500 feet, before being hit by 13 pounds to the inch. And here's the same view afterward. The frame of one of those tank cars was thrown against a building 200 feet away. A tank car body went 1,200 feet. The whys and hows of these excessive damage effects at static pressure levels where no such results were anticipated will require further study, as will the mechanics of precursor development over surfaces less suited to the development of heated ground air than the Nevada desert. While to date these damage effects have been observed in the precursor, it does not follow that attack conditions should be chosen to maximize precursor formation. Such effects may be characteristic of any low burst without regard to precursor phenomena. Although high bursts are still required for optimum damage on many important targets, the tremendous destructive force of a low burst has brought about an interim restatement of damage criteria for drag-sensitive targets and was the most important single finding of the military effects tests of Operation Upshot Knothole.